Good afternoon. It's my, it's my great pleasure to introduce today's Dean's Distinguished Lecturer, Barry Rashkover, Cornell Law School class of 1986. Barry is one of the leaders of Sidley's Securities and Derivatives Enforcement and Regulatory Practice, a practice that recently received the Chambers USA Award for Financial Services and Securities Regulation. And in that role, he defends companies and individuals in investigations and enforcement cases brought by the SEC, FINRA, the CFTC, state attorneys general, the DOJ, and others. Before joining Sidley, Barry was a senior official at the SEC's enforcement division, where he served as co-head of enforcement and associate regional director for the SEC's Northeast Regional Office. While at the SEC, Barry headed some of the agency's most important enforcement matters, including cases arising out of proprietary trading, insider trading, and fraud, including the Martha Stewart case. At Sidley, Barry's handled numerous high-profile matters involving cutting-edge financial issues relating to mortgage-backed securities, cybersecurity, LIBOR, and high-frequency trading. Chambers USA recently noted that Barry receives praise from his clients for his expert approach to major investigations by regulators and his ability to handle really high-risk cases in a thoughtful way. In 1999, he received the SEC's Stanley Sporkin Award for outstanding contributions to the agency's enforcement program. And he speaks and writes often on issues relating to SEC enforcement. And today, he's here to speak about the practice of internal investigations, which is a distinctive and highly specialized area of uh, litigation practice. Please join me in welcoming Barry Rashkover back to Cornell Law School. Thank you, Dean Penyaver, and thanks for all of you for, for coming and, and, and listening today. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to come back to Cornell Law School. Um, uh, I, I was here about two years, about a year and a half ago for my for a reunion, and um, I try to take advantage of whenever I have an opportunity to come here, so, so thank you. Um, as Dean Penyaver said, I'm going to talk to you today about um, internal investigations, and by that I mean when a company or an entity um, decides to investigate conduct within itself, okay, conduct by its own employees, conduct by its own officers and directors. Um, it's an aspect of my practice, I mean most of my practice is defending companies and individuals in SEC investigations and DOJ investigations, but, but that often in, will involve um, conducting an internal investigation. Um, and so it's an exciting practice. I mean, it's an exciting thing to do because you're, you're sort of looking for misconduct. You, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're, you're developing uh, interesting fact patterns. You're interviewing witnesses. You're assessing whether people are telling you the truth. Um, and you know, and where, and you're, and you're looking for where the bodies are buried, and so it can be a very, you know, exciting, interesting practice. But there are a lot of twists and turns, and a lot of traps for the unwary. Um, traps for the unwary practitioner. Um, and so I wanted to talk you through a little bit about what internal investigations are all about and how we conduct them. And, and some of the interesting twists and turns um, that, they, that they can take um, and practice pointers. So let's start with, you know, when, when might a company conduct an internal investigation? Um, simply put, when there's a potential issue uh, where they perceive that there could be um, misconduct. Um, so, you know, a whistleblower writes an anonymous note to the general counsel, right, saying, you know, I am concerned that um, the company has been overstating revenues for the past three years. Um, or uh, an auditor, the company's you know, outside auditors, um, spot something. Or there's a media report um, about potential misconduct of the company. Um, or if a regulator spots an issue and comes to, comes to the company and says, we think you should conduct an internal investigation. Um, 
they can arise in all of those contexts. Uh, you have to ask yourself, well, you know, but generally, why, why would a company undertake an effort to find misconduct within its own four walls? I mean, to some extent, it's a little self, it's not necessarily intuitive. I mean, a company is spending time and effort, maybe a lot of money for outside counsel, to find misconduct in itself. Why would, why would a company really want to do that? Well, there are a lot of reasons. The, the, the first reason, and, and, and you know, this comes up a lot with public companies um, that are SEC you know, re you're reporting, broker-dealers, investment advisors, investment companies, but you know, a lot of times the reason why a company will, will undertake to do it is that not doing it creates more exposure. So let's suppose, you know, my hypothetical scenario, whistleblower um, provides an anonymous complaint to the you know, public company's general counsel saying, I, you know, I am concerned that the company's been overstating revenues. I'm concerned the company's been understating its debt. I'm concerned that it's overstating X matrix or that matrix. What that could mean is that companies' prior financials might be wrong. Right? Financials that maybe they were for last year, the year before, year before that, but you know what? Financials that investors are relying on still right now. Or it could mean that whatever conduct they're looking, they're worried about continues to happen. Well, the general counsel in that situation, or really any responsible executive, sees that. If she doesn't react, if she doesn't say, well, I better look into this, and misconduct goes undetected, Either it's continuing to happen, which is the worst scenario, or it did happen, but investors are continuing to rely on financials that might be wrong, on a 10K annual report that might be wrong, 10Qs, 8Ks, that all might be wrong. All of a sudden, what was a historic problem now morphs into a current problem, and it becomes the GC's problem. And if she's perceived as complicit, all of a sudden, she has exposure. She, so she's got to react, right? So that's one example. Another example, you know, there's some examples that rise by operation of law. So Section 10, Capital A of the Exchange Act, Exchange Act 934, says that if an auditor uncovers an illegal act or evidence of a likely illegal act, which, can, which is pretty broad, actually, when you look at the definition, um, it's got to bring that to management's attention. And if management ultimately, you know, without going into detail on the statute, ultimately if management doesn't take that seriously, doesn't conduct its own investigation, the auditor will have to take it up to the board. And if that doesn't, if that doesn't help, the auditor might actually have an obligation, actually have an obligation to report it out to the SEC. So that's another scenario where a company might have to do an internal investigation. Likewise, for, for, for lawyers, if you are counsel for a public company and you receive evidence of um, what might be a violation of the securities laws, what might be a breach of fiduciary duty, um, under Part 205, Commission's Rules Promulgated under the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, you, 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 may, you may have an obligation to report that to the chief legal officer, to the CEO, and ultimately, if they don't react, either, you know, and, and, and the main way of reacting is conduct an internal investigation to find out if it's true, you know, you, you, you have obligations of your own. Um, and so there, too, another scenario where, by operation of law, a company may well end up having to conduct an internal investigation. What about an investment advisor? An investment advisor for a hedge fund, for a mutual fund, has a fiduciary obligation to its investment advisory clients. What if it finds out that there might be misconduct, misconduct that affects the funds, that may affect the operation of the funds? Well, as an exercise of that advisor's fiduciary duty, they too might have an obligation to conduct an investigation. Or by operation of a broker-dealer's compliance procedures. And so it can happen in a lot of different contexts. <coughs> Ultimately, it's fairly common. I mean. When, you know, basically, you're in a public company, if there's evidence of misconduct, there really is, is, is little choice. 
Um, you might want to do it also because if the conduct ultimately comes to light to law enforcement, whether to the Department of Justice, to the SEC, um, if the company does conduct an internal review and takes responsible steps, law enforcement is going to consider that when assessing what their reaction should be to that conduct. And that can make or break the difference between a company being charged with fraud and paying an enormous nine-figure fine, or with a company being charged with something much lighter, or under extraordinary circumstances not being charged at all. And so from a law enforcement defense perspective, it often makes sense to do an internal investigation. What are the objectives of an internal investigation? Ultimately, the objectives are to deliver a set of facts and a set of reliable conclusions so that the company can take action. This is not an academic enterprise. This is a real, real world action with real world consequences. Companies gotta decide, did anything happen that was wrong? Are our disclosures, our 10Ks, wrong? Are our financials wrong? Do we have to restate last year's financials, year before's financials? Do we have to take measures against employees or officers because they were involved in misconduct? Do we have to fire people? Do we have to reprimand people? The company needs to make real life decisions. Do we have an obligation to self-report to the SEC, to the Department of Justice? The company has real world decisions that it has to make and it, that's going to turn in large part on the results of that internal investigation. How ultimately, more often than not, the company is going to counsel whoever conducts the investigation, is going to memorialize their conclusions in a written report. There are a lot of complications from that. We're going to talk about them, about that report, because you bet that as soon as it's written, there are a lot of people who want to get their hands on it. And there are a lot of implications that flow from that. We'll talk about that in, in, in a moment. More often, the people who conduct the investigation are going to have to pre prepare a written report because the company needs a record of what was done and what was found. So who should conduct the investigation? A lot depends on the facts and circumstances. But you know, you know, a lot of companies will say, well, why can't our in-house counsel con conduct this internal investigation? You know, we have a, you know, many you know, public companies have big in-house staffs and they pay those people for a reason. So they say, well, why should I have to hire outside lawyers to conduct the investigation? And you know what? There may well be fat situations where in-house counsel can conduct an internal investigation. I mean, after all, they're still counsel. Um, their conduct is still presumptively privileged. It's in, they're acting in their capacity as counsel. Um, it may well be that the issues are sufficiently confined, sufficiently narrow, maybe discreet in, in the number of people that they involve, that it may make sense for in-house counsel to do it. But what happens when the issues are so pervasive that actually maybe in-house counsel is part of the fact pattern? Maybe in-house counsel approved disclosures that now are being put under a microscope. Maybe in-house counsel approved transactions that now are subject to the investigation. Well, obviously, in that situation, in-house counsel really can't conduct the, the, inter the internal investigation. Um, what is more, if you want, if you're, you're a public company, you're an investment advisor, broker-dealer, um, uh, uh, you want your, your, your fi the findings to have credibility, They'll have more credibility if outside counsel does them. At least that's how law enforcement will likely perceive it, um, because law, outside counsel is one step removed. They'll have more cre credibility still if that outside counsel is a firm that's never before represented the company or its officers and directors. Um, and so, when you talk to law enforcement, you know they they will you know about issues like this. They will they will stress that. Um, sometimes that's a, real, a realistic scenario, sometimes it's not a realistic scenario, um, but you know, law enforcement will definitely perceive outside counsel that's never before represented the company as more likely to bring 
to the facts, um, a level of independence that company counsel um, uh, uh, cannot, cannot bring to the situation. Who's the client? Right, that's an interesting question. Like who, when, okay, so you know what? I've been hired to conduct an internal investigation. Wait a minute, who's, who's my client, right? Well, maybe the client is management, right? You know, I get a call from the general counsel. We want to hire you to do an internal investigation to X, Y, and Z. Great, who's my client? Client may be the company management, but often when it's a really, if it's a, it's a particularly serious investigation, often financial statements, more often than not, outside counsel's client will be the board of directors or a committee of the board of directors. Um, maybe the audit committee, maybe a special litigation committee. Why? I mean, what, I mean, after all, if part of your focus of your internal investigation rises up to management, to senior management, to the role of the CEO, the CFO, how can they really be your client contacts? And it, it creates sometimes a lot of tension, right? Because um, the general counsel might hire you, and then all of a sudden you realize that you're, re you know, actually the client that, you know, actually retained you on the retention letter is the audit committee, and all of a sudden you're telling the general counsel, you know what, I can't keep you informed about the status of this investigation. I know you want to know what I'm learning and where I'm heading, but you know what? I actually can't keep you informed. Creates a lot of tension, but those are the realities of when, it can be the realities of when you represent the audit committee or, or, the, or the board of directors. How does it come complicated? I mean, it's, as I said, it's a lot of fun, right? You, 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 will be, you, know, you will be requesting from the company you know, hundreds of thousands of emails. You'll have armies of associates helping you and outside document review vendors helping you. And maybe you'll hire an outside invest forensic accountant um, and you'll be conducting lots of interviews of, of, of you know, people at all levels. It's exciting and it's a lot of fun, but how does it become, how does it turn complicated? Well, one way is the time pressure. I mean, situations happen, people are under enormous pressure. If, if financial statements have to be restated, you're under enormous pressure to figure out whether that, whether that has to happen. If there are disclosures out there that investors are relying in day in and day out, and you don't act quickly, that can be a, a problem. Um, and what happens when you know what, the investigation, the issue emerges and the investigation starts this time of year, right? It's, it's, it's February 21, companies are doing, finishing up their audits for 2017 if they're on a calendar year. The last thing they need is an issue to arise and an internal investigation because they've got to get their financials filed. If, they, if they're late on their financials, right? What, they're late on their financial statements. What can ultimately happen? Well, there are banks who give the company a line of credit that keeps the company going day in and day out, can pull their credit. If it's too late, FINRA will delist them. And ultimately, the auditors will not, will not agree to a clean audit opinion unless they have reasonable confidence that the investigation is, has, has taken its course. That can create enormous time pressure. So that's one stress. Another stress, the auditors represent a public company. So the general counsel gets this anonymous whistleblower complaint, calls his outside counsel, do I need to tell my auditors? Well, you kind of do need to tell your auditors because if this takes its course, you conduct an investigation, and weeks go by and you haven't told your auditors, they're gonna lose trust in you. That's, you can't have that, so you gotta tell the auditors. Well, the auditors now all of a sudden have to figure out whether an illegal act has occurred on, under 10 cap A. They put enormous pressure. They'll wanna see, we'll hear updates on the investigation. They'll ultimately want to see any report that's written. Um, they might wanna see um, interview notes. They're gonna want, they're gonna want updates. So you're going to have to manage the auditors. Um, do I have to tell the SEC? Well, you know, 
it may well be that there's nothing, it's less of a legal, often less of a legal decision, right? A legal decision is, has anything happened that is, that could, could be material for the company? Well, if you're at the beginning of an investigation, all you have are uncorroborated whistleblower complaint, you may have nothing. But you know what? If this is something that's likely to get out anyhow, likely to become public, or if it already is, you put your best foot forward in going to the SEC and saying, guess what? I'm, we've hired outside counsel to do an internal investigation. So now all of a sudden you've got to manage the, audit, the auditors, you've got to all of a sudden manage the SEC. Um, what happens if private litigation? Well, so now there's an article in the Wall Street Journal, plaintiffs spring lawsuits on behalf of shareholders. Now you have an additional complication because they're going to be interested in what's happening in the investigation. What, 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 a, what a potential train wreck, right? You've got a lot, a lot of balls in the air, a lot to, a lot to, 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 fig, to figure out. Um, okay, well, we've told the auditors, we've decided we don't have to tell anything to the SEC, we're gonna go in, we're gonna conduct our investigation. So I seek, you know, emails from, you know, the relevant, the relevant, you know, individuals, um, we hire an outside vendor. We are now reviewing a million pages of emails. Um, we're putting together binders of, of, of key documents to interview witnesses. Um, oh, wait a minute. Some emails have suddenly disappeared. Well, that's a huge problem, right? That's why the first step for any company when, when this happens is a document hold that goes to the right people. Right? Outside counsel, you better make sure that your in-house counsel is getting that document hold out. You, you know, chances are you're going to write it. Um, you've got to keep track of who they're sending it to. Um, and you want to make sure that people are seeing it and preserving documents. You want to make sure that IT you know, is, is disabling any automated email deletion that would happen in the ordinary course. Because the last thing that you want, the last thing the company should want, is for, is for somebody to decide that this is the day for him to clean out his email box and end up, and end up destroying what can be important, important evidence. It could be, it, the optics are terrible um, and it can, cause a, it can cause a lot of problems, especially if you've already told law enforcement about the investigation, you know, under certain circumstances, it could be obstruction. So, so you've got to get that document hold out. Okay, so you've got your document hold out, you've, you've got all your emails, um, you've learned that there are recordings of telephone conversations. Wow, that's great. I want to I want to get my hands on those telephone conversation recordings. Not so fast. And here's why: there are wiretapping statutes. There's the federal wiretapping statute. And every state has its own wiretapping statute. Federal wiretapping statute requires one party consent. Some state wiretapping statutes require two party consents. What happens? You say, okay, well, that's fine. You know what? That's another issue for me to investigate. You know what? Federal wiretapping statute says that the recordings can't even be used if the recording is made in violation of the wiretapping statute. Under an extreme set of facts, that means that if a lawyer listens to that recording and it was made illegally in violation of the statute, counsel can have exposure. And so before you get your hands on those recordings, you made her make sure that you know how consent was obtained, you know the firm's policies and procedures for them. Um, if it's a two-party consent state, you know, do they have a beeping or some other way that you can argue that not only was the person who placed the call aware, but the person on the other side and all the participants were aware? Is there a pre, is there a pre, you know, a, 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 an audio, an auto recording at the very beginning? You want to know that. Easy pitfall for outside, for outside counsel. What about overseas documents? You know, I, I've heard that there are emails from the company's Munich office that could be relevant. So I want to get my hands on those. Not so fast. You better call, you better call counsel in Munich and make sure that you know or they can advise you on what the EU privacy protections are because it may well be unlawful under certain situations to get those emails. So you better think about that. Okay, I've reviewed my documents. I'm ready to conduct interviews of the 20, 20 witnesses. 
Um, and so I sit people down and I say, you know what, I'm outside counsel, I'm conducting an internal investigation, um, we have a lot of questions for you. And I barrel on through my questions. What have I done wrong? What I've done wrong is when I go and I report to the SEC, you know what, we did this internal investigation and guess what, we found this guy, we think this guy committed a violation, we, can, we have problems with this guy's conduct. The individual turns around and says, wait a minute, when you interviewed me, I thought you were my lawyer. I, I, I thought that what I was telling you was privileged. There's a, there's a case that came down about 10 years ago in California involving Irela Manila, where exactly that happened. Um, and, that, and that's because the lawyer didn't do what, what she should have done, and that is you have to tell the client, I am counsel for the company. This is a privileged communication, my conversation with you. But that privilege is a one-way street. The privilege is held by my client, the company. The company may take what you say in words or in substance and may communicate it to third parties, communicate to the Department of Justice, the SEC. So you need to be aware of that. We are not your lawyer. We don't represent individuals in this investigation. Those are simple words to get out. Sometimes it takes, a little, it takes a little nuance and finesse to get them out in a way that doesn't freak people out in a big way, because it will. Um, and sometimes, no matter how you know, much finesse you try to use when you get them out, there's no way that people are not going to be fr frightened. But you need to tell, tell people that, because otherwise, again, it's a pitfall for the unwary. You can have exposure. You can have an ethical problem. Um, client says, I don't want to go on, the individual says, I don't want to go on this interview without my own counsel. Do I need a counsel? Well, do I need a lawyer? You got to be careful with that one. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not your, I'm not your lawyer. You're free to go and seek your own, your own lawyers. Questions will emerge like, well, if I hire my own lawyer, will the company pay for him? That's an issue with the company. Bylaws will help determine it. You know, contracts with the, with the individual will help determine it. Um, Employee says, I, am, I want to take five. I want to take the fifth. I'm not going to answer your questions. I'm taking the fifth. Can the company fire him? Yeah, the company can fire him. Um, uh, it's often a, a dilemma, right? If, there are real, if there's a real potential for criminal exposure, you know, someone takes five, that means that they are out of a job, but maybe that's the only thing they can do because what they tell the company could, be part of the, could end up being part of the criminal case. Um, so, at the end of the interview, I say to the, the, the witness, I say, okay, thanks for spending time with me now. Um, I, I'd like you to keep quiet about what we've talked about. In fact, I don't want you to tell anybody about, you know, any of these facts, any of these issues, and I mean, I don't want you to tell anybody, but inside the company, outside the company. Well, at one level, sure, right? It's, 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 it's a confidential investigation. You, you do want that person to keep quiet about the questions you've asked and maybe the answers that she's given you. After all, you don't want her then to go to your next witnesses and say, here's what they're going to ask you, here's what I told them, and you better corroborate that. You definitely don't want that, right? But here's the potential pitfall. There's a rule. Pretty new, Rule 21F17 under the Exchange Act. It says a company can't take any steps to, to help prevent, to prevent somebody from talking to the SEC um, or law enforcement about uh, underlying potential violations. And so you can't take any steps that the person might construe as, gee, I can't talk to the SEC about this. The SEC's actually brought enforcement actions in that context. They often involve severance agreements where somebody like leaves the company and you know has to agree you know to never again never talk to law enforcement about you know about issues at the company or or as part of the company's policies and procedures working there. Um, there's language that chills their ability to go in front of law enforcement. Those are where the cases um, have been, but yet it's a significant it's a significant issue. Um, somebody goes and. Um, and reports misconduct to me, a whistleblower, and I figure out who it is and I want to fire them. Well, um, there are Dodd-Frank protections that protect whistleblowers. 
However, today, and I haven't read the decision yet, it just came down, the Supreme Court came out with a decision today that said that the Dodd-Frank protections of whistleblowers protect whistleblowers who go to the SEC, but don't protect whistleblowers who self-report. Um, it is, the decision is Digital Real TV Summers. It just came down, so I haven't had a chance, I haven't had a chance to read it. But, um, but from the reports I've gotten, that's, that's what it says. Um, so keep an eye out for it. Um, potential involvement of, uh, 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 of law enforcement. So you've decided, you know, you've now done your investigation, you've put together your report, um, and you've reached certain conclusions. In some places you found that, you know what, the, the concerns were unfounded, but you've, you have found other things. You, either way, you've put together a report. The SEC is interested in knowing, you know, you have to decide should we, you know, if you haven't told the SEC, should we tell the SEC? Um, assume that you have, you go in, the SEC wants to know. The SEC wants to know what you've concluded. They want your report. There's parallel civil litigation too because there have been articles about this and as I mentioned before, plaintiff's lawyers brought shareholder, shareholder class action. Um, so the SEC wants to see the report. Well now that, that creates it you know, a lot of tension, a lot of issues, because on the one hand, you want to, you did the investigation for many, many reasons, in part because to show the SEC that, you know, your company is responsible, um, and you'd like them to know what the conclusions were, that, um, both the, the good and the bad, because it's going to ultimately make for a better outcome for the company. But, you know, when you give that report over to the SEC, you know what happens? What happens is that whatever attorney-client privilege attached to that report and your investigation is gone. In fact, there's a good argument that whatever work product protection applied to that report, if, if you know, the report was you know, made in anticipation of litigation, whatever work product protection that may have attached to that report, there's a good argument that it's, it's gone. In fact, even if you don't actually give the SEC the report, but tell them about the report, or and in fact, tell them details such as Here's what the witnesses told me in my investigation. There's case law that will say you've, you've waived work product protection, you've waived privilege. For example, there's a case that came down pretty recently, SEC v. Herrera, um, out, of the, out of the Southern District of Florida in, in, the, in this past December, and held just that. Um, a large law firm had to provide notes of certain witness interviews because they told the SEC, they didn't give the report but they told the SEC about their internal investigation, about what particular witnesses told them. So you say, well, okay, you know what? So the SEC gets my report. I don't care. I wanted them to get the report. I'm happy for them to get the report. Okay, but it doesn't end there. And that's because you both have to think about horizontal issues and vertical, vertical issues. What do I mean by that? Well, once you weigh privilege and work product with respect to one entity, You've kind of waved it across the board. Yes. So what about Mr. Plaintiff, class action lawyer, who now is going to want that report, right? There's now a very strong argument that you waive work product, you waive privilege. You, don't, you waive it as to one, you waive it as to the whole world. Um, it is true that when you waive privilege with the SEC, you can ask the SEC in a written document to keep what you've told them confidential. <laughs> You can ask them to agree with you that they, from their perspective, the waiver privilege doesn't extend to other people. Fact is, although there are a few cases that have held those, the majority of cases that have reviewed those agreements do not uphold them. So when you produce that report to the SEC or when you tell the SEC about that report, you, you need to advise the client. You need to assume that um, that, that report might get into the hands of, of others such as the plaintiffs that are suing your company. But it's not just the report, right? Because as I mentioned with respect to the SEC v. Herrera case, um, it can extend to your investigative files, right? Um, if you tell SEC about you know, witness interviews and what witnesses said, you know, those, those notes that you took of those interviews may be fair game for the SEC to get and for Mr. Plaintiff's lawyer to get too. 
um, if you have other investigative files, you know, where the court decides to draw the line as to what you've waived and what you haven't waived, you know, can be unclear. It can be fuzzy. Um, and so you've got to contemplate that when you, you make that presentation to the SEC, that it could have those implications. Okay, so let's, let's contrast that. Let's talk about the auditors, okay? So it's two weeks before um, the financials are due, and the auditors want to finish up their audit. They're all done. It all turns on them learning about the results of your internal investigation. So they say, I want, to, I want the report. I want to see the report, too. Let's put aside the SEC and our little hypothetical. SEC, you've not given the report to the SEC. Auditors are the first ones to want it. Do you have the same privilege and work product waiver issues with respect to the auditors? A little bit, little bit different. Attorney-client privilege, yeah. You give the report to the auditor, privilege is waived. Work product protection might not be waived. There are cases, a number of cases, that will say, well, when you give something to the auditors, they're not really an adversary. Um, when you give something to the SEC, they're kind of an adversary, right? But when you give something to the auditors, they're not really an adversary. Consequently, just because you give the report to the auditors, to your outside auditors, does not necessarily mean that you waive privilege. And again, there are a number of cases, a lot of cases that have held that. But again, I, if you're interested, in, in, you, you should look at the Herrera case that I mentioned before, because that says, that says the same it says the same thing. Um, what if, OK, so now here's an interesting issue. What if some of, the, some of your company's investors, some of its shareholders want the report? Right? So you know, maybe you've got you know, a big, big hedge fund that owns you know, 3% of your stock, you know, a good deal of your stock, and you have to say, I, I heard you conducted an internal investigation. I'd like to see the report. I mean, after all, I've got a fiduciary duty to my clients, and I need to, to have confidence when we invest in a public company like yours that um, if there are issues, that, that we have full transparency into them. Well, that, you know, that both raises waiver issues, but it also raises Reg FD issues for the company. Right, because under Reg FD, SEC Regulation FD, public company can't selectively disclose material non-public information, you know, to certain classes of individuals, including shareholders, without making broad public disclosure. So, you know, unless you're willing to take that report and attach it to an AK, you know, you may not you may not be able to share it with an individual investor. The investor says, okay, but I hear that. I, I hear that. Mr. Hedge Fund says, I, I hear that, but I, I still want to receive the report. You know what, I'll agree to keep it confidential, and I understand that under SEC Reg FD, if I agree to keep the material non-public information confidential, then it's not a violation for you public company to give it to me. All true. But you know what? That's not a solution at all, because because what that means for the hedge fund is they can't trade. Once they have a duty of confidentiality and they have material non-public in information, it will be insider trading if they look at the report, don't like what it said, and decide to dump their stock. So a hedge fund advisors highly unlikely to do that. So there are a lot of issues if investors ask you for, for the report. Um, practical tips. Um, first, if you do an internal investigation, have your eyes open to the fact that somebody may someday be examining it against your evidentiary record. There's no amount of double checking that can be enough, whether it's re-reviewing the emails, re-reviewing your notes, your, your interview memoranda. Give yourself the peace of mind and work hard, even after you've drafted the report, well, still in draft, go back. There's no amount of diligence that can be enough um, to make sure that what, you, what your notes say, what your evidence says supports your, your, your report. Um, segregate your investigative files, okay? You know, here are the files that we created, here are our interview memos, here are the emails that we gathered. If we had outside you know, forensic accountants do analyses, here they are, segregate those. So that if somebody, some, some, someday somebody says, okay, court says, you know what, you've waived, you know, the company disclosed this report, they waived privilege over this report, You've got to produce all of these documents. You have them segregated. You have a high degree of confidence of what related to the investigation and, and, and what didn't. Um, check the report against to-do lists. So you went into this investigation with all the right intentions. You created 
lists of about 150 to-dos, items to, items to handle, go back to that list and make sure that you either did everything on those lists or you've got a good reason for why some things were not done. But don't forget about those lists that you made early on in the investigation. Um, advise the client, advise the client. Make sure the client, end up walking the client through all the issues that we've, we've talked about. And I guess my final piece of advice is be brave because, and what I mean by that is, it's, it's often a very, very stressful situation. You might have people at your client who are hell bent against finding anything that, that anybody did wrong, and it sometimes takes courage to say, no, no, no. Our conclusion is that there were violations. Likewise, you might have in-house counsel who are, who are absolutely convinced that somebody over there in some office far away committed an egregious violation and wants to fire that person come hell or high water. If you, in your conclusion, your professional judgment, being careful and honest with yourself, conclude that, guess what, you know what? It didn't really happen. Be courageous and do, and do the right thing. Um, and so with that, if we have a few minutes for, for, for questions, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to answer some questions. Yes. It's, it's, never, it's never that simple, and it takes courage. I mean, but if you're, I mean, if you're hired by sophisticated people, um, they understand what they're doing, and, and they understand what they're doing by hiring a, 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 big, a big law firm, and they know the big law firm has a reputation. Um, you know, ultimately, client, I mean, honestly, one of the nice things about being outside counsel is, look, I, I got to make my clients happy. I've, you know, I'm, 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 I, I do this for a living, but you know what? Clients come and go. And if you think a client is pressuring you to do something that's not okay, clients come and go. Um, you, you take it up. If you, if you have a law firm that has a committee on professional responsibility, right? Like Sidley, we actually have our own office of, of, of Office of General Counsel at Sibley. And so when we have issues like that, there are partners I can go to and I can, I can work through with them how to handle the client. And if I need to get assistance from my firm, go to the client and say, it's not just Rashkover who co-heads this practice group. The head of the firm is telling you this is what you've got to do. You have those resources. If you, if you work for a firm that, afford, that gives that to you, you can take advantage of that. Question. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'm following your, your, your question. I guess, like, do you know of any examples of laws that prohibit um, certain types of behavior that would be violated? No. No, and, and in fact, I mean, have, have I done a survey? No. Could, I, could there be something that I'm not thinking about? No, but I would think that if they are in the realm of securities law, Issue one, I mean, yeah, there are blue sky laws, and, 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 but issue one would be, doesn't federal law preempt, preempt those? Um, that said, I am not aware of, of state laws that would prohibit an individual from going to law enforcement and, 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 and reporting a, via, a violation, or even going within a company's internal Audit department or in-house counsel. I'm, I'm, I'm not. Maybe I'm not thinking something. I've never heard. I've never heard of that. You're you're introducing a concept of an undercover investigation, and that I that 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 could add a wrinkle. I don't know what you mean by an undercover investigation. So so Mr. Whistleblower decides 
to go ahead and um, have a conversation with in-house counsel about a concern and then takes that privileged conversation and reports it to law enforcement, yeah, I could see a problem with that, right? Because you, you, don't, you are breaching, your, you are doing that in a privileged setting. It's actually not your personal privilege, it is your comp company's privilege and you're breaching that. Yeah, I could see an issue with, with something like that. Yes. You're welcome, thank you. Any other, any other questions? Yes. Um, I, 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 I think you characterize it well. I mean, it, it, you, you are dependent on IT to gather all the emails for you. Increasingly, you're dependent upon IT to help you review those emails. And I don't mean people as much as searches and, 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 and um, you know, artificial intelligence to help gather the emails. Increasingly, the role for like 20 associates to like spend, you know, weeks barreling through a, a million emails, is, those, those days are, are quickly coming to, to an end. The only thing that I will say though is, and you need, you need IT to help you crunch data, you need outside experts, it's absolutely true. The only thing that I'll say is, In my view, emails and numbers never tell the whole story. And there is no substitute, even, even in our age, where, where, you know, where computers are everything, there is no substitute for getting the witness's explanation. Um, and so that is something that I do not see changing. You can look at a bunch of emails and construe them to mean one thing, but you could talk to the author who wrote them who actually might say, I know how these sound, but guess what? This is actually what I meant, and here's why that makes sense and why your interpretation of those emails doesn't make sense. That is, that is a key part of the investigation. That will not change. Thank you. Thank you. For purposes of work product waiver? Yes, and, and, and if so, if there are no drawbacks, uh, would that relationship uh, be uh, slightly different? Because I would imagine in this case, because of the spectrum rate, uh, there would be no need to inform these companies. The, 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 I, think that it's, I personally think that it's a stretch to say that, that the company has a common interest with the public at large. I could see, and I haven't, I haven't researched it, might be cases out there. I could see someone credibly arguing that there's a common interest with the shareholders because you owe them a fiduciary duty. I could see that. Um, uh, and that's nice. That's a nice argument that some litigator might make, you know, six months when, later, a year later. What I will say, though, is when you're considering the issues prospectively and you have the uncertainty of how a judge may rule, you've got to consider that those arguments might not work. That the investors giving up rights to be a whistleblower? I don't think so, but ordinarily the investor would not be the whistleblower. The investor doesn't know what's going on inside the company. The shareholder doesn't know what's going on inside the company. If you're, if you're taking a job as an employee of a company and the company tries to get you to sign something that says I'll never be a whistleblower, that will violate Rule 21 F17. No, I, the hedge funds won't, I mean the hedge funds won't be the whistleblower. 
against the public company. They might be ones who are interested in knowing how, what happened with the investigation and whether they invested in a company that cooked its books. But the hedge fund or the investment advisor is not likely under that scenario to be a whistleblower. It, it won't know anything. Dean Penyal? Yeah, so um, you talked about the potential for a conflict with management as the investigation unfolds. Uh, if management is your client, and as the, as the investigation is unfolding, that potential for a conflict arises, what, how do you navigate that? You know, especially you know, around New York, when it's very clear cut, I think you, what you do, maybe you withdraw or you go down and say, we need to change the client or something like that. But, uh, where there's sort of more, where you're in a gray area and there's more discretion about how broad the scope of the investigation should actually become, and you have any judgment calls to make, what, how do you navigate that potential if, if, if it's not fully developed yet? You navigate it by, by being transparent to the client that it could happen, and that if you have a, if you ultimately get to a point where you need to investigate the same people who hired you, that they know you might have to resign. You need, the most important thing is transparency with the client. Because you might be in a, in a, in a, in a dilemma. I mean, if, if, you can't, if you can't conduct your investigation thoroughly, ultimately, because it turns out that the issues penetrated senior management, you've got an ethical obligation either withdraw because you can't do your job, right? But at the same time, if, if you see that coming and you don't, you don't season the client that I might have to withdraw, then you've also done them a great disservice, right? Because you've worked now on this thing for three weeks and you've billed them $700,000 and you've done a huge amount of work and they are under great pressure from their auditors to get, to get an investigation done, and now they've lost three weeks, you've done them a great service. So the most important thing, from my perspective, is if you see that as a potential, you've got to be transparent about that right away, and maybe they'll decide they need to go to some other council. Can you change horses midstream? Can, can, can you say, okay, you need to switch over, to now I'm gonna, you know, the, the board is gonna be my client, I, I don't know, I, I don't think that you can do that so easily, and here's my, here's my reasoning. My reasoning is that, okay, now all of a sudden, management's no longer your client, they're a former client. Now the audit committee's your client. But you still can't be adverse, right, to a former client with respect to something that was within the scope of the prior representation. So I would think that that would present that, that, that complication. Yes? If I'm, you know, if I'm defending a client in, in an SEC investigation, you know what, I, I could, you know, and I'm, I'm defending them in the investigation. The SEC's doing the investigation. I'm defending them. I'm defense counsel. And, but the SEC's asking questions. I need to figure out the facts, right, because I can't represent my client and know what arguments to make without learning the facts. It's different from the internal investigation we were talking about, but it's similar work, right? Sure, I may end up coming across all kinds of things, and I have. I mean, I've, I've, I've come across all kinds of other issues, and, okay, first and foremost, I have an ethical obligation of client confidence, right? Um, there are ethical rules that will guide how I, how, I have to, how I have to handle that. But depending on what it is, if it's bad enough, right, I might have that Sarbanes under extreme circumstance, I, Mr. Outside Counsel, might have the Sarbanes actually up the ladder reporting requirement to take that issue that I learned about and tell the, the chief legal officer and tell the CEO. Because remember, my client is no individual, it's the entity. Any, anyone else? Well, thank you all very much, it was a pleasure. <laughs>